Think about this. People appear to have less and less understanding about the intellectual arguments behind some of the most controversial movements in the political and social landscape. In spite of a logical or even unified narrative, people nonetheless go along with the overall momentum of modern social movements. The assumption appears to be that since the media and progressive activists are basically on the side of anti-racism, social justice, diversity, freedom, and feminism, we should give them our wholehearted support, even if what they say is little belligerent at times. All of these are noble causes, of course, but the hypocrisy is ubiquitous in all of them. In this episode, we're going to take a look at some of these contradictions. If you think these conversations are as fun as I do, hit those like and subscribe buttons. My name is Chris, and this is The Think Report. The idea that we need to support a movement simply because their intention is good is a dangerous assumption. We need to be brave enough to say no when things stop making sense. In some of the most famous cases, movements that start out fighting for justice end up as some sort of tyranny. The most famous case being Hitler and the Nazis. Of course, the party's full name in English is National Socialist German Workers' Party. Nazi is short for its German name. Germans were struggling after World War I, and with the growing gap between the rich and the poor, the Nazi party stepped in as a socialist movement with progressive ideas to save the lower and middle class. Of course, they ended up as right-wing fascists, but they started as left-wing progressives. Back to modern-day movements. Many of them have good intentions, but if they genuinely care about justice for everybody, including the most marginalized, they do well to read up on some of them. Unfortunately, the media convolutes most things for us. Controversial articles make media publishers the most money. Outrage is quite literally the currency of internet, and truth no longer matters. As a result, we've become deeply and desperately confused about how to make sense of these topics with a cobbled-together narrative rife with contradictions. One of my favorite contradictions is one that commentator Matt Walsh points out. Like or dislike Matt Walsh if you wish, but the contradiction is clear. Liberal media and the woke require that we accept that a man can become a real woman. But when we ask what is a woman, it can't be defined. The contradiction is how can someone actually be a woman if the word woman has no definition? A woman is not anything in particular. There is not one particular thing. It could be many things to many people. Some women have penises, right? Some men have vaginas. There are cases where some words we use are intentionally undefined. For example, if you're someone who went to business school or maybe you took a business course, you may be familiar with the term widget. Widget is used to refer to an anonymous product. You could say that a business produces seven widgets and sells them for $10 a piece with a profit margin of 50%. How much should it cost to produce the widgets? We could say that the business produced phones or pillows or barrels of oil, but for sake of solving the problem, it really doesn't matter. An anonymous product called a widget is perfect. But we don't need to anonymize gender or sex for the sake of something else, like a math problem. If we did, would woman be the word we choose? Of course not. Woman can't be undefined and defined at the same time. The word woman already has a pre-existing definition, which is to have a certain type of reproductive cells, specifically eggs. The woke can't simply hijack a word that already has utility. We'll need to replace it with something else. Liberal media in the woke turn what should have been a civil discussion about including minorities into our culture into this volatile hatred towards anyone who disagrees with them. Feminism has been one of the loudest advocates for the transgender minority. Miss Magazine, which is a US-based feminist publication, has a yearly list of top feminists. Multiple women on this list were added simply for being transgender. As an ideology, feminists aim to break the patriarchy and reinforce equality between men and women, often citing things like the gender pay gap or tearing down stereotypes. But trans people fight for the exact opposite. They want the stereotype. They want the heels, the long-styled hair, and the dresses. These are two groups that couldn't be fighting for more opposite goals. But yet, feminist groups continue to celebrate trans victories. It seems very strange that feminist organizations like Miss Magazine, which fought for the eradication of female stereotypes like staying at home or their place is the kitchen, 
would accept these stereotypes when it comes to transgender. Feminist movements can't both support and not support female stereotypes at the same time. Now, I will say that unlike the 2021 list of top feminists, which had several trans women on it, the Miss Magazine 2022 list of top feminists has none. So it appears that the wokeness is starting to wake up to some of its logic fallacies. Employers and managers are encouraged to hire for diversity. At a minimum, we're asked to hire staff that reflects the diversity of the general population. For example, since 14% of the U.S. population is black, we're asked to have approximately that same percentage on staff. The reason for this is not only for affirmative action, but also because people from a variety of different backgrounds will often have a variety of different perspectives, which is true. However, once hired, employers and managers aren't allowed to ask this person what their perspective is as a black person. It would be considered culturally insensitive to single out someone as a minority. So there appears to be a contradiction here. We're encouraged to hire minorities due to their unique perspective, but then be reprimanded for asking them what their unique perspective is. Here's another contradiction on this one. In an interview, employers cannot ask an individual's religion, national origin, race, or disability. So how can you hire for diversity if you don't know who you're hiring? The only exception to this is if the trait is a bona fide occupational requirement. For example, if a Catholic church is hiring a priest, the individual should probably be Catholic. If a woman's shelter is hiring staff, it's reasonable that they hire a woman. Otherwise, if employers can't prove that the trait is a bona fide occupational requirement, then they'd be in trouble if they asked about a candidate's religion, national origin, race, or disability. So the contradiction is that employers can't be asked to hire for diversity, but then also restricted from verifying diversity. How would you be able to ensure that you're indeed hiring the correct way? We're going to spend a couple minutes on this one because when anyone drops the phrase fascism or tyranny, you got to back it up. That's not something you can just casually drop. So let's jump in. Feminists fought for equal rights and won. From these strong women came other movements like homosexuality, which wanted sexual freedom. The result was the removal of laws that made homosexuality illegal and by removing the ban on same-sex marriage. Removing laws and creating freedom for oppressed individuals to express themselves is almost always a good thing. But we've gone over the top of this mountain and we're starting to come down the other side. We're now adding laws with the hope that this somehow creates freedom. The U.S. is in far better shape than Canada on this one, and probably will be forever due to the First Amendment, the freedom of speech. Canada has the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which also supports freedom of speech, but unlike the U.S., where you need 75% of the states to make a change to the Constitution, called ratification, the Canadian Parliament has the power to change the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and other acts, like the Canadian Human Rights Act, at its own discretion. The Canadian Senate is supposed to keep Parliament in check by researching, discussing, and recommending action for Parliament to take. But the Senate has no real power, which makes them a bunch of slouches collecting a paycheck. I don't say that lightly, or with any partisan agenda. The Canadian Senate really is just terrible. This is important because in 2017, Justin Trudeau modified the Canadian Human Rights Act so that for the first time in Canadian history, the government compelled speech, meaning that the government was telling you what to say, which is different from telling you what not to say. The U.S. is in much better shape here, although there are some exceptions here as well, like true threats. But they're reasonable ones. In legal parlance, a true threat is a statement that is meant to frighten or intimidate. They constitute their own category of speech, like obscenities, child pornography, fighting words, and the advocacy of imminent lawless action. That is not protected by the First Amendment. The biggest difference between the U.S. and Canada is the U.S. Compelled Speech Doctrine, which sets out the principle that the U.S. government cannot force an individual or group to support certain expressions. Thus, the First Amendment not only limits the government from punishing an individual for their speech, it also prevents the government from punishing an individual for refusing to articulate, advocate, or adhere to the government's approved messages. This is a stark difference from compelled speech from Justin Trudeau and the Canadian government. 
This is how all this circles back to tyranny. Tyranny is an autocratic form of rule in which one individual exercises power without any legal restraint. In this case, the power is compelled speech, and Justin Trudeau has already implemented it without constraint. Back to the contradictions here. Tyranny is a type of oppression, in this case, speech. But we can't obtain freedom through means of oppression. Those are completely opposite principles. But you know, maybe freedom isn't the goal anymore. And maybe we should have some civil discourse on what our countries want to strive for over the next century. Cultural appropriation is one that always seems to have many inconsistencies. What exactly is cultural appropriation? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Cultural appropriation is when someone takes elements from a culture not their own and remakes and reduces it into a meaningless pop cultural item. I'm thinking hipster headdresses, tribal face paint, and yes, those so-called Halloween harmless fun costumes. It's not harmless fun. To marginalize a minority is to treat them as insignificant or peripheral. But I would argue that this is not the case in most accusations of cultural appropriation. In 2020, the Kansas City Chiefs withdrew their mascot in response to accusations of cultural appropriation. But is that cultural appropriation? Are they marginalizing Native American chiefs? It seems more like cultural appreciation. Sports teams don't name their teams after things that are marginalized. They use names that are badass with the goal of intimidating their opponents. They use a name that they would be proud to call themselves. A team wouldn't call themselves something inferior in hopes that it would intimidate their opponents. Those two things don't go together. We appropriate from everywhere. First from our parents, then from our friends, and then from our greater country. It's impossible to know the source of all our customs and traits that we inherit and adopt. Canada has three major cultures, Native Canadian, Quebecois, and the rest of Canada. The U.S. has two, Latin America and the rest of the U.S. To say that we don't absorb features from multiple cultures within our own country is nonsensical. To say that you have a culture is also to say that you've appropriated it from somewhere, if not everywhere. If a man wants to dress up as a woman, who cares? And for the same reason, if a Westerner wants to wear an Aboriginal headdress or get a Japanese tattoo or open up a Chinese restaurant, who cares? You either agree that it's culturally inappropriate or you don't. But don't be inconsistent. If you're going to say that a sports team can't call themselves the Chiefs, then you must also believe that a white person can't practice yoga and vice versa. Apparently I've caused a boycott of a very large retail chain simply for being trans. If this person put bronzer on their face and decided to identify as black, we would cancel Dylan in a hot minute. But when this person wears hot pants and talks about how we need to normalize women having a bulge because Dylan has a penis, also decides that we need to have Dylan on to talk about girlhood and how Dylan can be a mom one day. I find a lot of Dylan's content to be sexist and blatantly stereotypical of women's experiences to the point where they seem kind of performative. Dylan is authentically Dylan. We can put it like that. But if Rachel Dolenzal isn't a black woman, then I think you know what I think about Dylan. It is worth noting that cultural appropriation is different from blackface. Blackface has its roots in a form of entertainment from the early 1800s called The Minstrel Show. What's the matter with you boys shooting up that man's hen house? I'll shoot any chicken trying to follow me home. Well, why don't you get a job and go to work? No! The Minstrel Show was an American form of theatrical entertainment. Each show consisted of comic skits, variety acts, dancing, and music performances that depicted people specifically of African descent. The shows were performed mostly by white people wearing blackface makeup for the purpose of playing the role of black people. The shows caricatured black people as dim-witted, lazy, buffoonish, and superstitious. To be clear, these weren't flattering representations at all. Taking place against the backdrop of society that intentionally mistreated and dehumanized black people, they were mocking portrayals that reinforced the idea that African Americans were inferior. These were specific forms of entertainment designed to poke fun at black Americans and slaves. So to sum this one, wearing blackface is appropriation, 
But that's not why we don't do it. We don't do it because of the impact of minstrel shows. We don't do it for the same reason that we no longer have slavery. No matter what your values are, it's important to have consistency in your perspectives and ideologies. Whether you think that cultural appropriation is bad or tyranny is okay and so on, what's more important than your perspective is that none of your perspectives contradict each other. Otherwise, that's hypocrisy, which is bad because not only do hypocrites look foolish, but they're unpredictable. Unpredictable people are hard to be around because you don't know what they're going to say or what they're going to do next. Think about that.